So, hello everyone, welcome to the Statistical Society of Australia's December webinar. We're really glad you could join us tonight. Uh, it's, I'll, I'm Susanna Cram, I'll be your chair today. So this is our last webinar for the year. We'll be returning next February. We have an excellent lineup of speakers already, so stay tuned for further details. So as Mark mentioned, please do keep your microphones muted throughout. Use the chat window to type in any questions or comments. Um, I'll read out your questions to David at the end, and he'll also be receiving a log of everything that's entered into that window. So it's an absolute pleasure to have Professor Sir David Spiegelholter speaking tonight. David's a chair of the Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication in the University of Cambridge, which aims to improve the way statistical evidence is used. His background is in medical statistics and he's published prolifically. I'm currently reading his latest book, The Art of Statistics, and I highly recommend it. David was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 2006 and knighted in 2014 for services to medical statistics. So over to you, David. All right. Thank you very much, Susanna. I it's a great pleasure to, to do this. Um, odd, you know, it's not what I usually do. I like, you know, I give a lot of talks and uh, usually I'm sitting there watching whether people are falling asleep or looking at their phones or whatever. And I can't see any of that. So uh, you can get up, you can go and get a coffee. Or I've got, the other thing is, of course, it, for me, it's nine in the morning and um, I've just had my breakfast and, and uh, but you won't be doing that. So there is a slight odd feeling about this. Can I just show you one thing? I am in my office at home in Cambridge. So oh, this, that's my view out of my window and the boats have stopped rowing up and down. Uh, nine o'clock, they stop rowing. So usually that's full up with boats rowing up and down. Okay, so off we go. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about communication. I mean, I'm a statistician, as um, you know, many of you will know. Um, you know, I started off, you know, doing methodology, uh, writing books on expert systems and probability and Bayesian analysis and clinical trials and, um, and uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo work for doing Bayesian analysis. And, um, and I did that in my career. And then with great pleasure in 2007, I, could, I gave it all up. <laughs> it was wonderful. I stopped going to statistical conferences. Uh, I stopped writing stats papers and so on. And that's because I had a friendly philanthropist, a billionaire, who gave me uh, money, who, gave, who endowed a chair of public understanding of risk. Um, and in order to do different sorts of things, and so in order to spend time you know, giving talks, writing popular books, doing climate change, making programs for the BBC, for um, now I've just written this new book, which has got me on CNN and doing other stuff, talking about statistics in the new statistics in society, how they're used. And that's what I've become. I've become a kind of performing statistician. And then a couple of years ago, he gave us more money. And now I've got a whole group, Winton Center for Risk and Evidence Communication, which is an odd lot. In fact, there's 11 of us now. Um, and uh, we're based in the maths department, but they're, they're psychology, everybody else is a psychologist or an ex-BBC communication person or a web designer and so on. And so that's the kind of thing I'm going to be talking about. They're the people I work with now. And I think it's something that's important for statisticians to know about, that the work doesn't end with the analysis and the report. It goes on after that. And what happens after that is what I'm going to be talking about today. Okay. The point is that numbers are often used to persuade rather than inform. And um, I, I feel this is a, uh, is a vital issue in today's society, a society full up with misinformation, with claims of evidence, and yet the bad use of selected evidence in order to justify policies. And so I'm going to start you know, on this thing. Well, I've got to mention it, Brexit. I mean, I'm sorry, it's just causing an absolute mess in our country. We had this referendum, and numbers were used in both campaigns, Remain and the Leave campaign. Um, the, the Remain number was this one, every family is going to lose £4,300 a year. Now this is, a, you know, a, just it was based on a model from the Treasury, but really it's based on huge numbers of assumptions, it's based on a change in 7% reduction in GD, less GDP than we would, would have otherwise, there's no uncertainty given, although they did calculate some uncertainty. Um, it's, it's not a figure that, uh, you know, who knows, it might be true at some point, but we've got no idea. Certainly, they had no idea at the time. It was, but it's not as bad as the leave number. This was this famous number, which actually, I reckon this number won the referendum. On the side of a bus, we said in the EU, £350 million pounds a week, let's fund our, fund our NHS instead. I genuinely think that that misuse of a number, and it really was a misuse. First of all, it's wrong. 
it's about double the true figure, you know, taking into account rebates, and refund, all that sort of stuff. So it's wrong, but, um, but it's very cleverly, very cleverly used. And something I would do, if you were <laughs> sitting in front of me, this is when I start the audience um, interaction, I would say, okay, let's say you're on the remain side, and let's assume the number's true. Um, how, what would you put on the side of the bus to make it look very unimpressive, to make that number look small? How could you make that number look small? Okay, and so what I'd expect to get back from, from the audience, uh, first of all, say, well, make it a, a proportion of a small, of a bigger number. <clears throat> and in fact, that's less than, say, GDP or something like that. It's less than 1% of GDP. And as we'll see later, that's, that's the um, error in GDP. Um, it's less than 2% of public spending, for example. So, you know, this is a tiny, fra tiny fraction of, of what we spend in the country. Um, the other thing is to say it's 0.35 billion or something like that, because nobody knows what a billion is. And, but the, the classic way, which I'm sure many of you would think of, is to do it as per person. So uh, we could say there's about 60 million people in the UK. That's about six pounds a week per person. That's about two cups of coffee from Starbucks per person. And that's already starting to look not actually so that massive. Then we could say it's about 80p a day. It's about, as far as I can see, it's about a dollar and a half at the moment. That's uh, in the UK about the packet of, uh, price of a packet of cheese and onion crisps. So you could say, you know, on the side of the bus, we could have put, we send the EU the price of a packet of crisps a day. And that would not have won them the referendum. I can guarantee that. So, but the number's the same. What we've done is change the way the story is told. And this is the crucial thing. Let's assume we want to communicate in an honest, trustworthy way. That is a big assumption I'm making. I am assuming that you do not want to manipulate somebody. You do not want to sell something. You're not a, even a campaigner. Or any, even you're not even a campaigner for climate change or anything worthy, say that, no, let's assume we want to be honest and trustworthy and tell things as they are, which is what I believe we should be doing. Numbers do not speak for themselves. We give them meaning. Uh, this is uh, really almost a quote from Nate Silver, what he says at the beginning of Signal and the Noise. And their emotional impact depends on how the story is told. And I think we as statisticians should understand better how the way in which we communicate our findings, our, our conclusions, influences their emotional impact and whether they're seen, in what way they're seen. And we need to take more responsibility for how that story is told, because otherwise somebody else will tell their story using our numbers. We need to try to make sure that they're communicated in a balanced way. And this is particularly challenging in the areas of risk and uncertainty, when we don't know. We don't know what's gonna happen, um, and we don't know a lot of things. We don't even know what's happened all the time. We don't know what's, the, what's true. We don't know the science. We don't know. You know. And this is the world we work in is one of risk and uncertainty. And, um, and, and, and th th that's what I want to talk about today. How can we do this better and in, in a more honest way? Okay, so let, I'm going to use stories. I always teach through stories. Um, okay, this is one from, last, from April. Uh, CNN headline, eating just one slice of bacon a day linked to higher risk of colorectal cancer, says study. That's actually extremely good. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a very good uh, um, uh, in a headline, actually. That's very accurate. Yeah, it's, it's good because it says it's only linked to, it doesn't say it causes the higher risk of colorectal cancer. Let's compare, let's compare that with a headline from the tabloid UK, tabloid, rasher of bacon a day is deadly. And, and you know, th this is typical of the headline. Now, the curious thing is I know Sean Wooler at The Sun. The article is very good. If you read the article, it's very good. Um, he knows what he's talking about. I talked to him on the phone. The, the, um, the, the headline is awful because he doesn't write the headline. It's a sub-editor who sticks the clickbait headline on. So that happens all the time. So what actually is the story? Oh, yeah, here we are. Bacon and sausage, there's an Australian one. Bacon and sausage, sausages fuel cancer twice as much as previously thought. That's quite, a, that's actually not bad. You've got the fuel cancer, which, suggest, which strongly suggests it causes it rather than linked to, um, but not too bad as a headline. Okay, so what is the story? If you go down and read the text, this is the numbers. 25 grams of processed meat a day associated with the 19% increased risk of getting bowel cancer. Yeah, yeah, what does that mean? You know, who can interpret that? Is that important? Do we care? Awful. You know, 
first of all, the 25 grams, that's about a slice of bacon or a small sausage or something. Yeah, that's the first thing. So it's like a bacon sandwich three times a week. 19% increased risk. What this is, this is the relative risk and it's known to exaggerate the apparent effect. This is a manipulative way to communicate risk. It's frowned upon. Everybody says you shouldn't do it if you want to be tell things how they are, but everyone does it. Partly because it's what comes out of epidemiological analysis. If you do a Cox regression, you get a hazard ratio. If you do a case control study, you get an odds ratio. All these are relative risk measures, which, um, which epidemiologists communicate, but nobody understands and nobody and they are open to manipulation. What we need to understand it to communicate is absolute risk. In other words, 19% of what? Otherwise, we just don't know how important that is. Now, we have to look somewhere else because nowhere in any of the press release in the article does it tell us that around 6% of people will get bowel cancer anyway. So let's pretend for a moment there's 100 people listening to this webinar. You, you know, you middle class or professional Australians, you probably this morning sat down to your grains and berries and stuff like that. Anyway, so um, sadly, you know, six out of 100 of you will get bowel cancer anyway, people like that. So what we're talking about, what's a 19% increase over 6%? Now, unfortunately, I don't know any journalist who can do that calculation. They know they should, but it's using percent in two different ways. It's 19 relative percent of six percentage points. This is difficult, but we know how you should do it. You know, a lot of research has shown that we need to think in terms of what um, Gigerenza is called natural frequencies. We call them expected frequencies. What does it mean for 100 people? There we are, 100 people like you, you know, your, your middle class people eating your berries and stuff. So sadly, six out of 100 will get bowel cancer anyway during their lifetime. Let's compare that with 100 people who three or four times a week sit and eat that, uh, stuff that down their gob. That, how many are going to get bowel cancer? That many. You see that difference? That's one extra. That's the 19% increase over the six percentage points. So all of those people, all 100, are going to have to eat that um, every day, you know, three times a week, the whole life. That's about well, a couple of hundred times a year. That's about, uh, you know, that's about 10,000 each. That's about a million bacon sandwiches. And you'd expect one extra case of bowel cancer. And that's if it's causal, which it probably is. But that's, um, so uh, that, you know, and that puts it in perspective. I think. Um, <clears throat> of course, the headline is changing all the time. Just a few couple, last month, the headline changed. Boffins conclude bacon safe by Sean Wooler. Interestingly, I, I could talk about this quite a lot. Um, this is based on exactly the same data. It's just a different team of people are drawing the conclusion, are, are interpreting it. Exactly the same numbers have gone into both stories. It's just different groups of epidemiologists interpreting it in different ways. So, but I won't, I could talk for hours about that one. Okay, so um, something we're particularly proud of is that we, uh, were advisors for the Department of Veterinary for Education. And now this idea of expected frequencies is um, in part of the maths curriculum for teaching probability in the secondary school. And we've actually written a book and we've got a MOOC on teaching probability using this idea of, of expected frequencies, which I think is a very, very powerful idea. Okay, let's look at you know what's going on here we know how does this happen that some research starts at one end and by the time we see it as members of the public it's been distorted um and uh, what it means is that uh, i wonder if you can see oh you should be able to see this um you know there's people who actually do the research the surveys and the academics and they because when nobody sees what they do um it gets filtered through either the people who commission the work or the scientific publications and we know the problems that happen through selective publication um, of, of, of research. But most people don't see that either. Journalists don't read the science, science publications. They see they, it's filtered again through the press offices and the comms departments. And that gets their press releases get sent to the journalists. Um, and then they write a story, it goes to the editor who might choose the story or not, and then might and will usually stick a ghastly headline on top. And then we finally see it. By the time it's gone through all these filters, uh, I become deeply skeptical of almost anything I read in the papers, especially health stories, um, because you know I, the joke I tell is we know the story about Groucho Marx, who said that you know I would never join any a club that would have me as a member. And similarly, I I got this paradoxical uh, feeling that you know, the very fact that I'm hearing a health story is reason to disbelieve it. 
because it's gone through all these filters. It's interesting, it's newsworthy, probably means it's wrong. Okay, the press release is a particular problem. We're spending a lot of time trying to improve press releases with the Science Media Centre in the UK, and I could answer some questions on that if people are interested in what we're doing. Um, here's a, just a classic example. Here's a rather, um, not a, to be honestly, a slightly worthy but dull paper from Sweden, and uh, which showed that we observed consistent associations between higher socioeconomic position and higher risk of glioma. Uh, richer men got more brain tumors. And they said that this could very well just be an artifact of, the, um, of, of how the data is arrived at. And uh, I would again usually ask an audience, so quickly stop and think, why might that be an artifact? Okay, two reasons. First of all, richer people live longer and have more time to get brain tumours, but that's allowed for the analysis because it's a Cox regression. It's age adjusted because age is the um, time variable in the regression. So, um, uh, but the other reason is that richer people have better health care. So they're more likely to be diagnosed. They always get more diagnoses of these conditions. So they said this could be an artifact. However, the press office said high levels of education linked to heightened brain tumor risk. The study wasn't about education, but never mind. They wanted to get some coverage, so they upped the story. And I think you can guess what's going to happen. By the time we get to the Daily Mirror, we get why going to university increases the risk of getting a brain tumor, which, I mean, if I was, if it, usually with a live audience, you get a laugh from that because it is such a wonderfully absurd headline that there's, you know, the, the, has lost all track of what the actual story was about. So it, we do have this problem with, and I think the press releases a lot of that to blame. Okay, press officers can be helpful. I'd like to talk another risk story um, about alcohol. No amount of alcohol use is safe, uh, we see. Um, no alcohol is safe to drink. Now this is a, a story last year, you may remember it. Uh, no amount of alcohol is safe for your health, that our study finds. This is my favorite. Just one drink a day can increase the risk of premature death. So uh, you, have, uh, those of you who are sitting there seven, eight o'clock in the evening, and contemplating that beer. Well, just remember these headlines. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, Sydney Herald, no safe level what we're getting wrong with alcohol guidelines. So this came out at the same time as well. So this idea of no safe level of alcohol went around the world, had a huge impact, huge coverage. Okay, is that reliable? You know, it's a risk story. How reliable is that communication? Let's go back to the, to the paper. This is the Lancet, you know, Fantastic top medical journal. I don't like it, but it's the top medical journal. <clears throat> and this was a fantastic group. This is Gates funded group, Chris Murray's Global Burden to Disease Gang in, in um, Seattle. Um, huge study, massive study, which, which looked at alcohol use and um, harm all around the world. Massive. Nobody took any notice of it at all, except for that headline. Uh, it wasn't even a headline, that was just buried in the paper somewhere our results show that the safest level of drinking is none but it was highlighted in the press release and so that's what got all the coverage okay what does that mean this is the way they did their data analysis i'm deeply skeptical of this data analysis they found every study they could find on every possible harm that alcohol could do and put it in some massive model you know like that's just for ischemic heart disease showing the dose response of relative risk against standard drinks daily and so they put all that, they get all that mess, throw it there, uh, as far as I can see, regardless of quality of the study or anything like that, and fit a line and put some uncertainty around it. So that's what they're saying for ischemic heart disease is they're estimating that actually up to five drinks a day, it's protective, and um, alcohol's protective, and then it gets worse. And that's the sort of J shape that many people have suggested, but it is contested. Cancer is generally reckoned is, is monotonic. Um, it, the risk just increases right from nothing. And uh, then they added up all these 23 outcomes and came to the conclusion when they fitted the curve, drinking one alcoholic drink a day increases the annual risk of developing one of 23 alcohol related health problems by 0.5% compared with not drinking at all. Okay, if we see something like that, now it's, it's a relative risk, it looks pretty small. We should, our, you know, suspicions, tentacles, sensors should just shoot up. We should be right. Come on, let's hit this one. Let's, let's see what, and we should demand to know what does that mean in terms of expected frequencies? Okay, then the Lancet press release gave them to us very kindly. In 100,000 non-drinkers, you'd expect 914 of these conditions a year. 100,000 drink, one drink a day, you'd expect 918. 
Okay, this doesn't look a huge increase, but at least we now know how big, you know, the actual numbers of cases. Now, the shocking things, the scandalous thing is that those expected frequencies are not in the scientific paper. It was only the press office who managed to wheedle them out of the authors, and which is great. The Lancet press office is excellent. But it's actually a scandalous because the Lancet guidelines explicitly say that risk changes or effect sizes should be given in absolute values rather than relative changes. So the authors, the reviewers, and the editors all broke Lancet guidelines in, in allowing this communication. Absolutely shocking, a scandal. Okay, let's put things in perspective. How you, I'm gonna do a bait, you can guess what I'm gonna do. This is such fun, I could tell you, just trying to destroy a story like this is, is such fun. Putting things in perspective, the first thing is that this means that 25,000 people having one drink a day for a year gives rise to one extra serious health event. Remember, it's four extra in 100,000. I call that the number needed to drink, which if, for, if you're an audience that works on evidence-based medicine does get a laugh because there is this well-known thing called the number needed to treat, which is how many people have to take a drug for one person to benefit. This is how many people have to drink for one person to be harmed. The number needed to treat. Okay, so now let's, okay, let's put this in perspective. Number two, <clears throat> if you, you know, now have your one beer or your smallish glass of wine, you know, so that's all you have in the day, you actually end up having 3.65 kilograms of alcohol a year, uh, which is about 16 bottles of gin. So the, these very light, these very light drinkers with their one drink a day are in fact shoveling down that much drink a year. It's quite a lot. But remember, there were 25,000 of them. So that's 400,000 bottles of gin have to be drunk to get this one serious health event. Now I've worked out if you line those up full of gin, they go about 40 kilometers. So they go about a marathon of bottles of gin that someone's got to drink, or you know, 25,000 people have to drink between them to get that one extra harm, which isn't very big. In fact, it's completely trivial. Uh, not anything apart from the tax that you'd get from this is so massive that it's a, it's a, it's a pretty good investment. Okay, so this is a nonsensically small number, absolutely ridiculous. Now, but the other thing is, do we even think this number is, is true? How, how uncertain are we? Now, I've already said I'm deeply suspicious about their modeling, but let's look, let's assume the modeling was correct. That's the final picture. When they added up these 23 curves, that's what they got. Okay, so let's blow up the bottom corner. And what we see is this uncertainty around for, the, for one drink is almost symmetric around a relative risk of one. So they've actually got no idea whether it's harmful or beneficial at one drink. Uh, that's what they conclude. Um, but actually what we've got then is that there's not even confident there is harm at one drink. And it's if it was there, it's tiny. So it's neither practically nor statistically significant. So this story which went around the world is nonsense. Uh, you know, from this data anyway. So. Uh, I think this is very unfortunate indeed, shall we say. Okay, so what about risk communicator? How should we be doing it? Um, you know, how should, if we really want to be genuine about communicating risk and be honest, how should we actually try to do it? Barak Fishoff is the patron saint of risk communication. He's uh, in uh, Carnegie Mellon. He trained with um, both Kahneman and Tversky. Uh, he's a lovely, lovely, lo lovely man. Um, and he says some great simple things. He says, um, there's no best way to communicate risk because <clears throat> everyone asks him and asks, well, how should we do it? So I don't know, I don't know. we can't tell you, there's no best way to do it. You, because the, the, what you have to do is say, what do you try, you know, is to work out what, are, what do you want to do? You've got to know the first thing is knowing the audience. Got, who are you trying to communicate to? The other thing is what are you trying to achieve? You know, maybe you are trying to sell them something. Maybe you are trying to persuade them to, to do something. And sometimes that's reasonable. You might be trying to persuade them to evacuate because this volcano is about to erupt. You know, sometimes, you know, you do want to persuade people. So you might think you might want to persuade people to get, get their kids vaccinated because they're harming both their kids and the kids around them. So sometimes you do want to persuade, but um, they know, you know, we've got to know you on, I, I'm not interested in persuasion, but some people are. And then you've got to test different formats. You've got to see whether what your ideas are going to work or not and the crucial thing is that the best way is the one that fulfills your objectives and that's it so you have to decide what you have to do first and that 
you know, you think, oh, well, of course, that's obvious. Oh, my God. A number of people have come to us and it's not quite, not, they're not really clear what they're trying to do and, and who they're trying to do it for. So it, it's, it's the most basic ideas come forward like that. Um, I'm just putting that up because this is the kind of dogma that we, if people come to us, we just rattle off. Um, you know, if you are trying to communicate risks, and you have got some numbers, we'll come on to later when we don't feel we've got numbers um, or good numbers. Um, you should emphasize the absolute risks, use expected frequencies, and then keep the denominator fixed. Don't compare one in 100 with one in 50. Compare one in 100 with two in 100. Because the one in 100, one in 50, those one in, multiple one in statements are very confusing for people <clears throat> because the biggest number is associated with the smallest risk. <clears throat> and it's shown that you know, a good proportion, about a quarter of people, just can't understand that. So <clears throat> you can give relative, relative risks are fine, especially for rare events, earthquakes and volcano for catastrophic events. Very good to say, oh, this is 10 times as dangerous as normal. Um, yeah, that, that's a, very appropriate. Uh, using numbers and graphics, we'll see that later, and avoiding words like likely and common and may and could and all this stuff, com almost completely without meaning. Okay, standard stuff. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about some work we're doing in trying to implement these ideas, um, and that's based on, on the PREDICT system. I, won't, I could go online and try to share all this, but I just if you want to go and play with this, just go onto this website. It's a National Health Service-based system, and it's an algorithm for um, this particular one, for women with breast cancer and uh, we've put the front end on it um, basically it's uh, the algorithm was developed in in cambridge um, it provides personalized survival estimates after surgery for breast cancer after 15 years with different possible adjuvant treatments um, it's based on competing risk uh, regression analysis uh, cox regression three three thousand seven hundred women validated but actually with them um, then with the cumulative hazards smoothed with fractional polynomials. So it's, you know, it smooths the curves rather than having them very jumpy. Um, competing risk because we're looking at deaths from breast cancer and deaths from other causes. Okay, the crucial thing is that our center has put a, an interface on and we thought we might need to have two interfaces, one for the patients, one for the doctors, but no, no, you can make do with one as long as you're really careful about how it's designed and how things are explained. As I say, you know, so you don't, you know, you don't have two iPhones, you know, the, the, for, for clever people and stupid people. You know, a good design can work for everybody. And we copy really the way in which things like iPhone are designed using this idea of user-centered design where you're constantly tweaking, feeding back, getting feedback. So our psychologists and others are spending their time talking to doctors and patients and health professionals. Do you understand this? What's wrong with this? We are tweaking it, you know, in all the time. We're finally getting, we're getting, responding to feedback and trying to change it to, um, to make it more, um, make it better. So, and this is used, uh, I think it's used quite extensively in Australia, and it's used by, um, it's 32,000 users a month. So about a thousand women a day have their details put through this, through, the, through this program. And <clears throat> as you might expect, you know, you click, you put in the findings about the tumor, I can't, no good waving my arms around, is there? Um, actually, yeah, no, uh, so you put in the uh, findings about the tumor, and uh, the thing down here, the results, this is a table. This is really for the, the, the doctors when they run their multidisciplinary team meetings. Say, we just want to know the survival at 5, 10, and 15 years. So you can click on the thing and you just get surgery alone, 46%, with hormone therapy, 54% uh, in terms of survival from all causes. Chemotherapy puts it up to 61%. Trastuzumab, that's the septin, goes up to 65%. Bisphosphonates up to 67%. You know, if you had the whole whack, <coughs> We'd estimate 67% survival. And this is for a 65 year old woman with a two centimeter tumor. Um, so, and we also put in this thing here, if deaths from death, breast cancer were excluded, 76% would be survived 15, 10, 15 years. Um, so this shows the same data, uh, same results as the curves. So you see, we put lots of options, how you want to see the data, survival curves. <clears throat> Some people quite like survival curves. Sorry, I'll just have a quick drink. Not everybody. Um, and this shows how, you know, this is the baseline survival, how it goes up, all the different treatments. And then this is this is kind of about as good as you can get. This is almost as if you said these women either were cured of their cancer or never had cancer. This is the survival you'd expect. So this is sort of a ceiling, the best you can get up to. We've, the, we've spent 
a year trying to choose the wording for this and, and we still haven't got it right. Um, we can do a, a stack bar chart. I, I mean, you won't see any pie charts in anything we do, but um, stack bar charts, we don't like this either. People get, people misunderstand this. We re I really have gone off stack bar charts. I think we're gonna have to put bar charts next to each other. I, I really don't like this at all. So this is probably gonna come out due to mis clear misunderstandings. Um, we can put it in text. You know, what does it mean for 100 women? And then icon arrays, like the bacon sandwiches. Difference being though, that when we started, we put little people here and that didn't go down very well. It was too, too human, too graphic. We also had these great big black um, symbols. These are the people from dying from other causes. That was really quite shocking um, because that's kind of unavoidable mortality. Um, and so we, we downplayed that. Uh, so in, in, in terms of the visualization. Um, this, the, again, this can be misunderstood um, because people, some people were thinking that this meant our entire analysis was based on just what happened to 100 people. You know, they thought that um, <clears throat> this was an observed frequency in an actual 100 people, and that was our ba database, <laughs> rather than uh, you know, 100, you know, what we'd expect to happen in 100 future women who matched you know this thing so this is again until you start asking you cannot realize how much things can be misunderstood if you're not careful okay now a little bit of philosophy bit of philosophy not uh, I, this is my top philosopher she is great Nora Neal she's um uh, from Cambridge retired lovely woman brilliant absolutely brilliant I really reckon I don't like TED talks usually but I recognize she's done a TEDx talk for Parliament in which she talks about trust she is uh, it's a fantastic expert on trust and um, she does a great uh, really good nine minute video on that full of jokes and everything but she's a philosopher of Kant and this comes into all her statements she's very good at the philosophical soundbite you might say so her first thing she's worked a lot with the Royal Society and things on on data transparency and data openness and she's got this lovely checklist which we use in all our work. But <clears throat> when we say we want to be transparent, we want to be open. Of course we do. We're honest. We're lovely people. She's got, she says you've got to have intelligent openness. It's no good having, well, she, well, she didn't use this term, but other people use this term, fishbowl transparency. That's when you just go blah and show everything, all your code and huge spreadsheets, and nobody can understand it. Okay, what you need, <clears throat> first of all, first rule, is that you can, the, this is the most, I think this is really, really good list. I, I, I walk down the street muttering these to myself. Um, accessible, people are gonna be able to find it. <clears throat> that's quite, that's with the net, with the web now. <clears throat> now it's so much easier. It's gotta be intelligible. People have gotta be able to understand it and you have to be able to check that. <clears throat> and that's what we spend a lot of our time doing, checking what do people actually understand from what they're being presented with. It's got to be usable. Oh dear, my voice. Hang on. <coughs> Should have had some water. Hmm. It's got to be usable. It's got to actually answer their concerns. Um, and that means we have to listen. First rule of communication, shut up. Shut up and listen. What are people worried about? It's got to answer their concerns. Now you might say, oh, well, that's enough. No, no. It's got to be accessible. It should. But you, someone should be able to check your working. If they want to, they should be able to look back and you need to be able to justify why you're making these claims. Now, almost nobody will ask. You know, if you're an authority, people just take your what you say on trust, but they shouldn't have to. You should always allow your work to be checked and explained. And so we need, that's why explanation is so vital. Accessible, intelligible, usable, accessible. A really good, great list. Okay, so what do we do in PREDICT? Uh, we give some sort of verbal gist then multiple graphical and numerical representations with instant what ifs. It's great, I think, if you've got an algorithm. I mean, I don't consider this as a black box because we can write out the equations and, and present them to people, but it's still really useful if you can just do a, a click on, you know, what if this woman were younger, what if she had a tumor was smaller, et cetera, et cetera. And you get instant change of all the graphics. So that's very powerful. We can show the relative risks, the text, the tables, the formula, the graphics. We can show the maths and we can even give the code. Um, uh, you know, there's, I, there's the maths for the algorithm, you know, the proportional hazard model. Nobody ever looks at this. I wrote it all out. Nobody ever downloads it. It doesn't matter. It's fine. You know, it's, it's there. And so we, I feel we are being accessible. Okay. Um, we've got one for prostate now, which is great. And uh, we're now working on them for 
good for transplantation for lung and kidney transplants we're starting with um oh prostate's interesting because one of the problems right from the beginning we said we've got to have the side effects in there we've got to have the benefits and the harms of treatments it's absolutely vital um breast cancer side effects there's no good data resource no one's done the meta-analysis and things like that there's no good single trial that would give it shocking so we're having to do that work ourselves for prostate there was some good uh, good evidence and so for the prostate we can predict we can produce the survival curves but we can also give the potentially permanent harms of conservative radical prostatectomy radical radiotherapy and we do we do incontinence bowel problems and erectile dysfunction and say out of 100 men treated like this in three years how many have a serious problem in this area and we do them as little as a sort of tally charts which we tested and seemed to go down quite well it's sort of mixed between a bar chart and icon array a sort of stacked icons i really like stacked icons we haven't made them little people but we could so um and this has gone down very well uh, in terms of presenting that information as well so i think this is an essential part of any communication okay what about trust i mean people say we live in a society where you know, experts are not trusted and so on uh, i don't believe that and the, the other, there isn't good evidence for that but um so never mind we'll um you know we we again i've mentioned anora neil if we want to talk about trust we can um uh we can go to her um and she says the organization should not be aiming to be in, to increase trust she says and this is a, a kantian philosopher we should be aiming to demonstrate trustworthiness and it's such a simple idea that shifts the responsibility from the audience who should be who should be trusting us for some reason the responsibility comes to us to demonstrate our, our worthiness to be trusted you know that we it's our responsibility to be trustworthy we have to earn it we have to earn it brilliant idea enormously influential um the new code of practice for the uk statistics profession uh, official statistics profession which is it's not a bad read actually you know you'd think it'd be fairly tedious but it's not bad at all and the, the number one pillar is trustworthiness that is now and that's because of Anora's influence it's trustworthiness that people are looking for in their statistics okay part of demonstrating trustworthiness is admitting uncertainty about what we know so now i'm going to go to this other area which is to do with um what i would call epistemic uncertainty you know not about risks about the future but uncertainty about what we know here you know what the fact that we just don't know what's going on and so i think this is vital and very much under explored um okay let's look at an example let's look at um uh, bbc reporting office for national statistics saying that unemployment fell by three thousand over the last quarter well that sounds you know let's is that trustworthy let's look um if we check the website uh, we have to know that this is detective work this is serious detective work <clears throat> we go down here we find the website we look at the, something on quality and methodology and we click down there and eventually we find in the middle of a paragraph the small fall of three thousand at a 95 percent confidence interval of plus or minus seventy seven thousand. at which point usually i can hear laughter from the audience because this is appalling they've got no idea about whether unemployment has gone up or gone down and yet there's this confidence story written about why it's gone down so this is nonsense and uh, unfortunately this is what happens all the time i don't know what the in interval is it's a good challenge trying to find the confidence interval around u.s unemployment statistics is quite tricky i don't know um what it's like in australia because you're in australia I, I, sorry i don't even realize know whether you've got a claimant count or, or a survey as we have um so but it's often quite tricky to find that out okay bank of england do it a lot better i love these things fan charts so they when they're making predictions for growth over the next three years produce this fan chart based on a mixture of modeling and subjective judgment 30 percent 60 percent 90 percent intervals the bottom five percent here is unassigned it could be anywhere they don't model the tails and they don't put in a central projection because they know that people anchor on that they read their dan Kahneman. oh my god sorry sorry oh i've got to turn this off yeah sorry i should have turned my phone off How embarrassing right phone going off right okay right so um so what it, what it makes clear is they don't know what's going on what's going to happen in the future they're pretty uncertain about what's happening at the moment and they haven't got much of a clue about what happened in the past either <clears throat> although you know they, so the uh, uh, past gdp growth is actually very uncertain you know roughly to within plus or minus one percent as i mentioned which is 
um, which is what we sent to the EU, according to the bus. Um, so the, I think it's very honest. It's, it's extremely good. But can we do this? Can we communicate uncertainty about facts, numbers, and science without losing trust and credibility? And this is the last thing I'd like to talk about. Um, we've then taken this on board. We got a grant. This is, a, a, I think, a very important issue in modern society, whether we can admit we don't know without losing trust. So we're doing randomized trials. Um, our psychologists, you know, online, A-B testing for different formats for, for stuff. Um, uh, we look at the number of unemployed, the tigers in India, global temperature change, which are all facts, but which we don't quite know. And we give people either an estimate or a range or a verbal qualifier saying we're uncertain about this number and ask them various things. So this is just a very quick summary asking to what extent do you think this number is uncertain? And people do think as you go from a, a number to a range to a verbal qualifier, they think this number is more uncertain. So that's good. They do understand. To what extent do you think this number is reliable? And they think the number is less reliable as you go between the formats. But this is the important one. To what extent do you think the writers of the report are trustworthy? This is the comparison we're interested in. No reduction in trust whatsoever <coughs> if you, sorry, <coughs> if you give them a range rather than a point estimate. And we found this again and again and again, that if you can be, give them a range and just say, we, we don't know what the number is, but here we think it's fairly confident in this range. That is fine. No reduction in trust at all. Very powerful idea. Um, and we've implement, implemented this now with um, on migration statistics, slightly contested area. And, um, and uh, so which were, uh, they used to be reported like that. Um, and by the end of last year, with our, with our help, they were being reported like that. No, it's only a small step. These are fuzzy fan charts, essentially. They're, they're, um, you know, they they based on 90, 95% interval, the known uncertainty from the survey estimate. Now, the problem with this, people, we tested these, people quite like them, they understand what they're doing, they think that they're, they're more honest or whatever, but this is not the uncertainty around these numbers. It's only the sampling error, but the survey isn't very good. It's not a good survey at all. And so all those extra issues about the quality of the data <clears throat> are just put in there as caveats. And I think that's a real limitation of this science kind, kind of communication, even though we've worked on it. And in fact, you know, just to prove that earlier this year, um, as one last month, a few months ago, um, it turned out that the migration data really were, had been clearly um, mis misleading. And it's now been um, withdrawn as an official statistic. Our migration estimates no longer have the tick mark of being official statistics. So they're down with the level of police recorded crime in a sense that they're not trustworthy, considered trustworthy statistics anymore. So we've got to do something about that. So um, I like this, this is what's going on now uh, in our elect, current election. I quite like this, don't we think about it. This is what, how the BBC are communicating the uncertainty about the poll share from the vast number of polls that are being done all the time. They produce a running average as the conservative, Labour, Liberal, Liberal Democrat of the percentage, but and they produce a, a likely range, an interval there, but they also put the raw data on, and this for the polls. And this is very good. It shows the enormous scatter among the polls, far more than they should be. Each of these should be accurate to within plus one or three percent, and then they're clearly not. So the ver showing the variability helps us to understand uncertainty. And I mean, statistics, of course, is a the whole methodology of statistics is a is a bunch of tricks to turn variability into uncertainty. So uh, I think this is rather, rather good. Okay, so uh, yeah, just my very final bit. Oh yeah, okay, I go on. <clears throat> How do we say we don't know what's going on? How do we have the humility to admit we don't know? Now, <clears throat> if we feel we understand our model and we can calculate, a, we're confident about our confidence interval or our uncertainty interval, we know that's fine. You can quote that, no reduction in trust, we can do all that work. What if we don't even believe the confidence interval? This is the, which happened with the migration. We didn't believe the confidence interval. In lots of other areas, the data is so bad, bad study, bad stuff. You know, we can't always do beautiful studies. So this is something that is never taught as part of statistics, ever. We always assume X1 to Xn is IID, blah, blah, blah. Well, they never are. You know, what do we do when we, haven't got nice data. Okay, uh, we've written a whole paper on this, which I do recommend. Um, <clears throat> in um, it's in uh, open open so Royal Society Open Science, so freely downloadable. Had a lot of downloads. Okay, 
And one of the things we point out is that actually, most of the time, what we'd love to do is, to, is produce direct expressions of uncertainty. And that would be a probability or an interval or something like that. And that's what we get taught to do in statistics. And we like what we, we know what to do. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I don't think that's enough. And, and in most areas, that's not enough. We also need some idea of how good the data is, some indirect measure of the quality of the underlying evidence. Do we even believe our analysis? Do we understand what's going on? And you know, this is not part of standard statistics. Um, and yet, area after area, as I'm just going to show you, have come to the conclusion that we need something like this. Okay, so let's, for example, look in health. Um, this is um, how uh, um, benefits and harms of medical treatments are often presented now. Uh, this is looking at whether people have open heart surgery or, or done through a, a catheter for, for mending a heart problem. And they're looking at this for age 85s. They say this one is recommended rather than the open heart surgery for all sorts of reasons. And they do it properly. They say, what does it mean for a thousand people uh, for deaths? Uh, consider 45 fewer deaths. Um, if you do it this way, than this way, out of a thousand people, a thousand over 85s, fewer strokes, um, or more pacemaker insertions, and so on. On balance, then they suggest that this is the best thing to do. But what they also do is say, do we believe these numbers, not in terms of an interval, but in terms of the quality of the evidence? And this is, this is what's called the grade rating. It's a star rating. It's like TripAdvisor. So the TripAdvisor for evidence. Is it three star, four star? Or, as we see down here, for aortic valve replacements, one star, very low. So actually, you know, it looks like for re-interventions that the open heart surgery is, is better, but actually well, we wouldn't take much too much notice of this because it's not very good data. Okay, so this star rating idea is very powerful. Um, you know, for uh, climate change, people don't use a star rating, they use a measure of confidence. They say high, low, or medium confidence in the um, in the in the uh, data in the evidence, um, and uh, but you only get high confidence if you've got robust evidence and high agreement between experts. They put that in explicitly, and they only give if you got to have high confidence in the finding in order to make a conclusion or put a probability. So you know they actually, in terms of, for example, the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet, they got low confidence in the science that's actually due to to um, man-made climate change. Okay. What work centers? We've got a fantastic you know, um, panel of what work centers, which look at different types of policy. And in education, they produce a toolkit where they look at all these different things that people could do in the classroom and rank and give them rankings like TripAdvisor. So, you know, how, in terms of how much it costs, how much impact it might have in months of educational development. And this is the strength of evidence. Um, on a five-star rating, they use padlocks. We've started using mic little microscopes. Um, so aspiration interventions, uh, you know, getting into a classroom saying, you can do better. Well, it, you know, it, it's expensive. It doesn't seem to work and the evidence is crummy anyway. Whereas collaborative learning looks like it's cheap. Um, there's good evidence that it seems to work. So maybe we should know what we should be doing. Okay, so to finish. And I'm just going to stop now and take some questions, I hope. Trustworthy communication. This is my summary of what I, where I am at the moment in the work we're doing. Um, I think we should be informing and not persuading. And as scientists, we should be really separating any campaigning work we want to do from <clears throat> telling people actually how it is, both benefits and harms of everything that we might do. I think this is a, a fantastically useful list, <clears throat> which we use all the time in our work. Be confident about uncertainty. Don't be apologetic, but don't lead with the uncertainty. Start with what you do know and then say what you don't know. But then we're going to be doing something about you. Um, well, respect audiences. I, I really get annoyed when people are, you know, treat pe you know, public with derision. Oh, people are so stupid, they don't understand anything. That is so awful. I think it's unforgivable. We should respect audiences, listen to their concerns and test outputs. And that may, it means we, there's no one way to do this. I think I like multiple layered formats. There's lots of different, you present people different ways of the information and, and then allow them to go down to different levels. Um, I like this idea. I think, I think um, it's very powerful. We also got to preempt, preempt misunderstandings. We're the, we got to be bold in saying when people are wrong. You know, when, when there's something is just wrong, we've got to be in there and correct that. 
strongly and this idea of the backfire effect is not is not, that's not good there's not good evidence for a backfire effect and we're going to work closely with psychologists communication professionals and journalists so that's what we should what we should be doing um, so that's what um, that's my little summary and so I'm going to stop there and uh, I'm very happy to take any questions I'm not quite sure how this works but I'm really happy to take any questions okay thanks very much Thanks very much, David. That was an amazing talk. So uh, there's a couple of questions already come through. So oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, fine. Most important slide. Plug. Plug the book. <laughs> Ta-da! Great. Right, we happen to have one here. It's excellent. It really is. Right. Okay. That's done. I, feel I got that over with you. <laughs> Thanks, David. And it is a good book. Uh, so, so one question is in your opinion do you think that part of the problem with communicating uncertainty is that it feels like airing the dirty laundry on your own work yeah yeah i know i know that's i mean that but that's why we, i got this idea and we've got this very explicit facing idea can we communicate it without losing trust and credibility and uh, and people are very cautious about it. oh you know if we say we don't know will anyone listen to us or take a note and they'll go to someone who does they know, they know. so yeah I, there are ways of communicating uncertainty. I mean, if you just say, oh, wow, well, you're that is weird. If you, all you do is emphasize what you don't know, um, especially if there's a hint of, oh, your guess is as good as mine. So, no, it's hopeless. So that's why I talk about confident uncertainty. You've got to be not apologetic, but you've got to emphasize what you do know. You've got to try to be as explicit as possible about your uncertainty with ranges or whatever, plausible ranges. And you've got to also say that just because you don't know all the facts, exactly, you can still be confident about what you might do. You know, the, 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 you can have, <clears throat> it doesn't mean you've got decision uncertainty. You can be absolutely confident what, what's the best thing to do. So, um, no, you should, our research suggests that um, if you uh, have got, uh, um, got confidence about it, then you can communicate uncertainty. Great. We have a couple more questions just around the uncertainty also. Do clinicians appreciate uncertainty in clinical trials? Uh, I'm not sure what that means. That does, uh, does that mean when the clinical trials report? Um, I'm not, I, that's the only information I have, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, it does. Well, That's what it means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, God, we could get, don't get me on the p-values. Um, I could do that till the cows come home. Yeah, no, I think um, the, the uncertainty about, you know, what is the best treatment to give or what best thing to do is, no, it is a problem. And nobody likes, nobody likes that. They always like to feel, feel confident. And I think that um, clinical trial report, I, I mean, basically, I'm one of the ones, I'm one of the signatories to that letter in Nature complaining about the ideas of statistical significance, because I think that trying to reduce a clinical trial or any other scientific experiment to a single yes, no, significant, not significant, is nonsense. Terrible science and it's so wasteful. So I think that we, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm actually a good Bayesian, you know, haven't mentioned the word so far. You know, I don't try to keep off the B word, but Still, you know, you haven't, I haven't changed a bit. 45 years ago, I was indoctrinated <laughs> and I haven't shifted one iota. So, so my feeling is that um, we should be trying to communicate without using the terminology, uh, sort of posterior distributions of what we think the benefit might be, um, which fully allows then for the possibility of quite substantial benefit, even a little measure of harm and so on. We, and we should be finding good ways to communicate that. Um, the full the full distribution of the possible benefit. Can it happen that partial reporting of uncertainty becomes worse than not reporting at all? For example, will people falsely assume there's only a little bit of uncertainty? Yeah, no, that's on exactly good question. When we did that change to the migration stat, we were accused by some good people of saying a little bit is worse than none because people might think that that is the whole uncertainty. And in fact, as I said, the uncertainty is a lot bigger than what we were communicating. And that is the problem with using, you know, confidence intervals that we don't believe in. Um, it gives uh, an exactly the same with the polls. You know, they, their plus or minus 3% margin of error is nonsense. It's just not true. They, these are crappy polls based on telephone uh, you know, responses, 10, 15% response rate. 
So these yeah. are terrible, you know, these, they're, they're claimed margins of error are not good. And I think this is um, going to become an increasing problem in modern statistics, particularly as official statistics start moving away from, you know, surveys towards much bigger use of official data, routine data, um, and so on, is that the, the errors are not arriving, arising through sampling, they're arising through systematic biases. I actually think, and I could give a whole talk on this as well, that we need to spend much more time thinking about the size of systematic biases. And so moving, you know, moving into the quantifying these deeper uncertainties due to the lack of quality of the data. There's been a lot of work on this by Sander Greenland and us in, in other areas. And I think it's going to be a big area that's important. And it necessarily requires subjective judgment. Again, I'm, I keep away from using the B word because it's not using Bayes' theorem, but it is using the idea of quantifying um, uh, our judgment in terms of a probability distribution, which I still think is a fantastically powerful idea. How long does it usually take to pick apart a headline or story like the examples that you gave? So oh. I've tried to do this a few times and it was quite an effort. Yeah, but usually the problem is I often usually only got two hours or something like that, um, sometimes longer, but I get the stories under embargo from the Science Media Centre and sometimes have a day, but sometimes they want the comments later that afternoon. And so uh, you've got to move really fast. Um, if, you want to, if you want to take it apart, <coughs> get the alternative explanation and get the quotes back to the journalists. If you can do it quickly, you can get it in at the same time as the story. And that's a real winner. Actually, the next day is too late. So I missed the sun. Sean Wooler phoned me. And I wasn't ready to do the analysis. So I couldn't get that Bacon interpretation into the sun story in time. It had to come out later. Um, so, I, 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 yeah, I mean, I really, you've got to be able to do it in an hour or two. Yeah. So we have some questions around audience. So... Um, stories about going from the scientists to the public, but what about considering the statistical literacy of your audience? So even if you're delivering uncertainty really well, people might not actually get it because they're not literate enough. We also have a question around communicating with politicians. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, just uh, some... Yeah, some no, no, I mean, this is such an important point of, and that's why I said about knowing who your audience is. I, I actually... Um, don't distinguish too much now. I can give almost the same material to anybody because you know, I keep all the technicality out of it and try to use common sense ideas and simple painting. Um, you, you, you can't assume, I think what you can do is you, you can't assume technical skills on anyone's part, but you can assume that they're, they, they're kind of interested and they're not stupid. You know, I think you need to assume that. But, um, and I put politicians in with the almost the most numerous um, groups of the public. Um, we, whenever we test anything, we measure numeracy um, because we're looking all the time for low num improving low numeracy groups. We found a wonderful example of just, just putting results in tables as a massive benefit for low numeracy groups as opposed to putting it as t in text in a paragraph and so on. So, um, because the, the, uh, someone with low numeracy will find a number in the middle of a paragraph completely disturbing and it'll just put them off reading it completely. So um, I, I, uh, uh, you've got to be able to got to test for these different audiences, but as I said, nothing will satisfy everybody. Um, uh, you best to allow people to be able to sort of find what they, the way in which they like it being communicated. Um, uh, you're never going to be able to satisfy everybody, but you can do a lot better. People are so badly served at the moment. Um, things they receive are full of jargon. Uh, they uh, often, as I said, trying to manipulate them. They're not tested uh, and so on. So, you know, you don't have to be absolutely brilliant to do something that's really quite a lot better. Um, one of our other areas which we're working on well is, is communicating genetic, genetic findings to, to individuals and to health professionals because those reports are absolutely terrible at the moment awful and so um, a little bit of work a little bit of design listening to people what do they want how can they read it you know can make a massive difference great we have slightly gone well we're right on time now i think so last question is uh with quality of evidence metrics how do you compare them across studies is there a standard way of measuring this oh 
Brilliant. That's our research program. We've got some full time now doing a review of quality of evidence metrics. If you know of any, please let me know. I mean, there's lots scattered around. We keep on finding them. Um, and we're trying to work out, you know, what are the best qualities of that, the, and, and then to promote those um, to find out. Uh, uh, you know, to set some standards because everyone is developing their own at the moment in, in many different areas, and so I, I think it's a very it's a useful thing to look at. As I said, in the end, I much prefer these these things were quantified. Um, the star rating, I think, is good, but it's sort of um, uh, it's only a stepping stone towards leading to greater quantification. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. There's probably a few questions that we didn't quite answer, but. Uh, we will close the meeting now. So I just want to thank you again, David, for a truly amazing talk and sharing your passion and enthusiasm and insight. I'd also like to thank Mark Wick for his amazing technical support again. Uh, everyone, enjoy the rest of your evening. Have a wonderful, peaceful Christmas. And thank you.